All right, continuing on here with uh, the life of Moses. Um, we Last time we read through, uh, we started reading through book two. Uh, we led through birth and childhood, the burning bush, and now we're at the point, the meeting with Aaron. Again, it, it, it's helpful to know the story of Moses. And the first part of this book uh, outlines the story. So this is, again, the implications and contemplations of uh, Moses' life. The meeting with Aaron. We must return to the sequence in Scripture so that brotherly assistance might come out to meet us as we draw near the conflict with the Egyptians. For we remember the incidents of fighting and quarreling which involved Moses at the beginning of the life of virtue, the Egyptian oppressing, oppressing the Hebrew, and on another occasion a Hebrew disputing his own countrymen. For the one who had, has been lifted to the greatest virtue of soul by long training and supernatural illumination on the mountain, it is a friendly and peaceful encounter that takes place when his brother is brought by God to meet him. If this historical incident is taken in a more figurative spiritual sense, it will be found useful for our purpose. For truly the assistance which God gives to our nature is provided to those who correctly live life, the life of virtue. This assistance was already there at our birth but it is manifested and made known whenever we apply ourselves to diligent training in the higher life and strip ourselves for the more vigorous contests. So as not to interpret the figures by our own figure, I shall set forth my understanding about this more plainly. There is a doctrine which derives its trustworthiness from the tradition of the fathers, which says that after our nature fell into sin, God did not disregard our fall and withhold his providence. No, on the, on the one hand, he appointed an angel with an incorporeal nature to help in the life of each person, and on the other hand, he also appointed the corrupter who, by an evil and mal maleficent demon, afflicts the life of man and contrives against our nature. Because man finds himself between these two who have contrary purposes for him, it is in his power to make the one prevail over the other. While the good angel, by rational demonstration, shows the benefits of virtue, which are seen in hope by those who live all right, live aright, his opponent shows the material pleasures in which there is no hope for, of future benefits, but which, but which are present, visible, can be partaken of, and enslave the senses of those who do not exercise their intellect. If then one should withdraw from those who seduce him to evil and by the use of his reason turn to the better, putting evil behind him, it is as if he places his own soul like a mirror face to face with the hope of good things, with the result that the images and impressions of virtue, as it is shown to him by God, are imprinted on the purity of his soul. Then his brother brings him assistance and joins him for the angel, who in a way is a brother to the rational intellectual part of man's soul, appears, as I have said, and stands by us whenever we approach the Pharaoh. If, while trying to parallel completely the historical account to the sequence of such intellectual contemplation, someone should somehow discover so, is, should, should someone discover something in the account which does not coincide with our understanding, he should not reject the whole enterprise. He should always keep in mind our discussion's goal, to which we are looking while we relate these details. We have already said in our prologue that the lives of honored men would be set forth as a pattern of virtue for those who come after him. Those who emulate their lives, however, cannot experience the identical literal events. For how could one again find the people multiplying during their sojourn in Egypt? And how again uh, find the tyrant who enslaves the people and, and bears hostility to male offspring and allows the feminine and weaker to grow in numbers? And how again find how and how again find all the other things which scripture includes? Because therefore it has been shown to be impossible to imitate the marvels of these blessed men in these exact events. One might substitute a moral teaching for the literal sequence in those things which admit of such an approach. In this way, those who have been striving toward virtue may find aid in living the virtuous life. If the events require dropping from the literal account anything written which is foreign to the sequence of elevated understanding, we pass over this on the grounds that it is useless and unprofitable to our purpose, so as to not interrupt the guidance to virtue at such points. I say these things concerning the interpretation of Aaron in order to anticipate the objection which will arise from what follows in the narrative. For someone will say that there is no doubt that the angel does not does share kinship with the soul in its intellectual and corporeal aspects, 
that it already existed before our creation and that it is allied with those engaged in the fight against the adversary, but that it is not right to see Aaron, who led the Israelites in worship of idols, as a type of the angel. To him we shall reply, passing over the sequence with the point already made, that what falls outside our purpose is not to overthrow the agreement which exists elsewhere. Moreover, both words, brother and angel, are alike applicable to the meaning they might have to opposite things. For angel signifies not only an angel of God, but also an angel of Satan. And we call brother not only a good brother, but also the bad brother. So scripture speaks of the good brothers are proved in distress and of the opposite every brother will utterly supplant. Next up uh, is deliverance announced. A few more pages. So thanks for listening.